Hi, you're listening to the TL Podcast. My name is Thomas Lehuain, and I am interviewing someone who seems ordinary, but who is achieving extraordinary things. That is the quest of this interview. Last year, my partner was working at Blue Toro. Yes. They, they do mobile mechanics. Yes. Um, and the CEO sort of had a chat to me. and So basically, like, they had half their franchisees were doing really well, you know, sort of go-getters, going out, booking clients, doing the jobs, you know, sticking to, like any franchise, you know, this if you do this, you'll be successful. And then they had all these other guys that were sort of like not doing what they'd been told, like not following the roadmap, basically, to success. Yes. And they... And they they were blaming the company. You know, we've paid this money for, you know, to the franchise to be, to, to be yeah. a franchise, yeah. and we're not making any money. And they were going, well, you know, you're not making money because you're not doing what we tell you to do. Yeah. And she just, she, she just said, obviously, from my partner working there since we'd moved to the um, Sydney and stuff, she'd heard a bit about my story, and and she basically just said, look, every year we get a we get a leadership coach in, and mechanics being blokey blokes they sort of fall asleep you can see them sort of yep. and there's, only, there's probably only 30 or 40 guys in the room when I went and spoke and she sort of said you know you can see them just switch off and it just goes over their head and talk about you know mindset and hard work and goal setting and all this stuff and it just it, it doesn't relate and she said I'd, I'd love for you to come and just tell your story I've heard your story I think I think guys can relate to it. You know, half these guys are AFL guys, but it's the same sort of thing. You know, like if they see a, a footy guy, they might listen. And if they take yep. a couple of things out of it, yep. it'd be good. So I just sort of spoke about resilience and, and hard work and, you know, basically how every setback you get is sort of can approach one or two ways. You sort of can get pissed off and kick stones, blame others, you know, and generally that won't work out well for you. Or you can sort of look at yourself and, and um, and decide you know that you're going to make a change or work harder at something or do something different and that's that whole growth mindset thing right that you know if I keep doing what I'm doing I'm going to get the same result and so I just sort of talked about those kind of things and how it um, went with my story and my journey in the NRL and it was funny at the end we sort of had like you know 10 minutes for questions and they just kept coming like at the end in the end the guy that was running the conference had to be like all right guys like we're gonna have to stop asking questions they sort of throw up a question you know it was funny it's sort of there'd be two or three serious questions and then a, and then like a stupid one about you know how much do you hate Paul Gallon and then there'd be, there'd be more you know other questions so um yeah it was it was really it was really good experience for me and um I just sort of put something on my LinkedIn and sort of said you know, I did this last year. If anyone um, is interested in, in giving me an opportunity to just sort of have the opportunity to tell my story again, you know, like I, it was one of those things I was sort of really nervous to do because I hadn't really done it before. Yeah. I hadn't, hadn't got up in that formal setting and told my story to a bunch of strangers and almost had it as a learning experience for them. But it was, it was really, it was, you know, again, one of those things that put myself out of my comfort zone and got a lot out of it and I sort of just threw it on my LinkedIn a couple of weeks ago to see if anyone was interested. And, you know, I actually had someone from the business chamber reach out and sort of say, we, we sort of have a leadership conference coming up if anyone is interested in having a talk. And then we sort of, here, okay. we, are, here we are now. So. Okay. Well, let, let's start from here, Mark, right? I'm here with Mark Nichols. And um, let's start from here, even though I think we're not going to delete whatever you said beforehand. <laughs> we're going to be using it. Yep. But Mark, I don't know too much about rugby league. Okay, so don't don't think that I'm going to ask you too much, too many questions of that. Plus, you do a lot of podcasts, and I, I've been uh, hearing about things and reading some stuff. You, you're getting yourself known out there. Yep. So, what I wanted to talk to you about is mainly about leadership. You know, you hear about, let's say, the all black saying that you know better people make better all blacks. Then you, I've read a book from uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins many years ago, who said. It's not about having people if you want a great business. It's about having the right people. Yep. And, and so I want to talk to you about maybe the things that happens behind the television, be, behind the scenes, because I think that that's where you've got something to really share. And if you don't mind, let's start from here, because you're from Wagga Wagga. Yeah, I was, I was born in Wagga Wagga, but I actually grew up in Leighton. Um, right. 
I was only born in Wagga Wagga because it had a private hospital, and <laughs> and I um, and I was a couple of weeks over overdue, so my mum got transferred across. Hence there, so. that 194 centimeters, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> spent spent a little bit too too long overcooking. <laughs> right, okay, and so. Let, let's get it right in. In 2012, you, you were in um, uh, picked by the Raiders. Yep. And you stayed there for I think two years. Uh, yeah. Well, I sort of come through the I come through the grades at Canberra. So yes. I started there when I was 16 um, in the Howard Maths and and went through the junior grades and then I spent five years in the top squad um, at Canberra and debuted in 2012 and and left at the end of 2015 and sort of oh, I ended up only playing 19 games across. You know, pretty much five years of of, um, of the top squad. So, uh, ended up going down to Melbourne, uh, taking an opportunity to sort of sort of go down there. Um, but then the first the year that you were under what is it, uh, Craig Bellamy, he, he didn't play you at all. Uh, yeah, no, I had I actually had a few injuries. Yes. Um, so I, I sort of missed probably the first two thirds of the season with injury, and then came back at the end of the year and pretty much just sort of played reserve grade and. At that time, I was trying to play for another contract, so I didn't get a crack in the NRL, but got another 12-month contract, and then got to play um, a few games the next year in 2017 down at Melbourne. Yes, and then from then on, you just spent now, what is it, uh, three years it's coming up uh, with South Sydney? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I've, I've played three years now at South, yeah. um, and then obviously I uh, got another 12 months at least, hopefully um, a bit longer, but um, yeah, it's... Uh, like I said, I probably you know spent sort of seven years on the fringe, mainly as a reserve grade player. But um, since I've come to South, um, been able to establish myself a bit more as an NRL regular, and you know sort of really enjoying that part of my life at the moment. Yeah, I, I want to talk to you about two things today. W one is about your resilience, and I think that maybe you're late blossomers, a bit like me. You know, you 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 start to blossom now, so yep. you probably got like many seasons in, in you. Yep. But I want to talk about the first thing first, which is. You have experienced Craig Bellamy and now Wayne Bennett. That's two amazing leadership, right? Yes. Can two. you just speak out loud? I mean, do you have a favourite? Oh, look, as you say, two of the greatest coaches and uh, funnily enough, two very different coaches right. and two very different approaches. Um, you know, Craig is probably the hardest working guy I've ever seen. You know, he's the typical first bloke in the building, last person to leave. Um, so that's him, that's the coach himself. That's him, yes. Numerous times you'll walk into the gym, you know, and he's already he's already trained, you know, or he's finishing off a training session, you know, and, you, and we're talking 5.30 in the morning. And then, you know, you leave at three o'clock when you've finished your training and he's still in his office doing video. You know, and he sort of, because he does that, he expects, he expects that from his players, he expects that from his coaching staff, you know, and it's that, I'm going to work hard. I'm not going to leave any stone unturned. Yes. And I expect that from everyone else in the um, organisation. And, you know, it's obviously worked. It's probably, you know, up there with the Roosters, but they've been easily the most consistent and successful team for 15 years now. Yeah, that's correct. Um, Is he a, a hard taskmaster? Uh, yeah, I would say he's a hard taskmaster. Okay, um, so what if you don't turn up? Early and and what if you leave home, you know you leave early I mean does he sit you down after a few matches or I um I mean that's who I am as a player I'm a hard worker yes um, you know I was probably not not the most talented player so it was easy for me to get on board with that approach so I probably didn't get the the sit down but you know I guess if guys go down there you know with a lot of talent and um, you know maybe not the work ethic then you know you probably get a couple of opportunities and then. If you if you don't want to get on board, then we're not going to keep carrying you because you're just going to bring down the rest of the the rest of the group, right? So, um, you know, one of the things I guess the Storm are, are well known for is the the first thing they do for every player that goes down there, whether you're 17, just finished year 12, or you're 30 years old and you're sort of you know you're going down there to finish off your career, they make you go they make you go work for the first two weeks you're down there. So. Um, you're expected to train in the morning, do weights, go do a labouring job with a sponsor or whoever they've organised it for um, for two weeks and, and then every afternoon you come back and, and do running out on the field. And um, that's your, your first, you know, two weeks. experience. Yeah, yeah, your first experience down there and you sort of you think, geez, what have I got myself into? <laughs> um, but that's just setting the tone for, you know, what's expected here. And, and then I guess the thing is you quickly pick up on too, I tell a lot of people this, it's 
when I was at Canberra, and this is no offence to Canberra and what was happening there previously, but you know a lot of a lot of the extras, you know, doing extra weights, coming in on your day off, staying after training, it was probably wasn't done that much, and you know it was almost if you did it or you saw someone do it, it was almost like, oh, you know, you teach us, your teacher's pet, you know, like trying to get picked <laughs> in the team, you know, like sucking up to the coach or whatever. Yeah. But then you go down to Melbourne and everyone does it. And I remember, you know, going down there at the time, like I said, I was a, I was a fringe reserve grader and I had some opportunities to go to other clubs um, for probably a bit more money and longer deals. But at the time, I thought, you know what, there's something down there like, players just keep going down there and they keep turning into better players, um, you know, and they turn guys off the scrap people, you know, young guys that other clubs don't want and they just keep doing it year after year. So I thought, you know, there's something going on down there and I want to okay. I want to go experience it. And, um, and then when I got down there, I looked around and the blokes that are doing all the extras or, you know, coming in off their days off, they're all the guys that are in the 17, you know, and they're all the guys that are playing rep footy and you talk about you know, Cameron Smith, Cooper Cronk, um, Billy Slater, you know, they're the hardest working guys down there. And then you've got the guys in front of you, you know, like Jesse Bromwich, Dale Finucane, you know, these kind of guys, they're, they're the guys in my position and they're doing it as well. So I think, well, how am I going to get picked ahead of these guys if I'm not at least doing what they're doing? Yeah, at least, good question. Um, so, so you know, in the end, it's it's sort of what happens is every player goes down there and goes. They ask the same question. <laughs> yeah, they go, well, hang on, I need to get on board and 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 um and you know that that's one of the things to talk about leadership and, and culture and it's just they've created this machine you know over a long period of time and it's because it works and because they're successful players want to go down there right they want to I guess they ask the same question that I did they go well I want to go down there and become a better player or I want to go down there and playing a winning team and then they get down there and they work out well this is why and this is what I've got to do so you know it's 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 really um, like I said it's a really great organization and culture that they've created down there and they just continue to keep rolling on yeah so from uh, a lead from the front to Wayne Bennett what's the difference now you know Wayne's been around for forever right so um, he's obviously he obviously does something right as well but I think one of the the best thing about Wayne is he is all about the person and um, like before Wayne had come to the club I'd never I never had anything to do with him but I had noticed you know nearly every player spoke of him almost like a father figure it was I love Wayne you know I love being coached by Wayne and until then I'd never heard anyone say yeah. that about their coach right that oh, I love my coach you know I love been around him, I think he's the greatest. Um, and I think what he does really well is he he gets to know the person and he coaches the person. And he's you know his big philosophy is if you're happy and everything's going great off the field, then you're a better player on the field. And he um, he just he just has this innate ability to just I mean pick up what he needs to do to get the best out of every player and. You know, I've, I've never played in a happier team, you know, n normally you sort of have guys that are injured or kicking stones or guys who might not be getting picked, you know, in first grade who sort of can kick stones and create a bit of a nuisance around around the group. Like, you know, we have squads of 30, 35 players, but you can only play 17 every week in the NRL. So you've got guys that are disappointed week in, week out for not being in the team, but somehow he creates this amazing culture where everyone is just happy no matter where they where they are in their football you know season or their football journey. Um, he's just got this really really good ability. I, I mean, one of the things I noticed right is you, you come into training every day and there's 40 guys you know with our staff and, and players you know probably up to 50 and you say good day to every single person and you walk around and you say good day and, and and Wayne might not say good day to you every day but he will stop when he does. Most people you sort of say, G'day, how you going? Good, thanks. And, and you move, move on. on. Yeah. And he'll stop you and actually have a, have a convo with you. And it might, like I said, it might only happen one every, once every week or two weeks, but he, he remembers it. And I, I still remember one of the first conversations I had with him was, what did you do on the weekend? And, and I told him, oh, you know, like me and my partner went to Westfields and I said, I needed to get a shirt. I got my shirt in 20 minutes and, 
yeah, I said, I don't know how I fell for this because it happens every time, but we ended up walking around the mall for three hours and my partner looked at every second shop and, and, and you know, I sort of, we had a joke about it. And, and then like months later, he goes, again, talking about the weekend and he goes, oh, I hope you didn't end up at Westfields again for hours. And I had no idea what he was talking about. And I thought, what is he talking about? Yeah. And then it hit me, you know, like, 20 minutes later, I said, oh, that we had that conversation two months ago wow. and, he, and he still remembered it. And it sort of blew me away because I didn't even remember. I thought, you know, he's getting crazy in his old age, but that's the type of person that he is. Is he, is he actually has the genuine care for his players and he, and he remembers, you know, every convo. He's not going to just say good day for the sake of it or if he's going to ask you how you're going, he's going to sit there and take the five minutes to actually know how you're going and know what's going on in your life. And by doing that, he then knows how to get the best out of you as yeah. a player. One of our boys, uh, I think it was Rod Dillon, who runs uh, one of our offices up in uh, Peninsula in Umina. Yep. At the beginning of the year, he went to a um, one of these luncheons and, and Wayne was there. And he asked Wayne, actually, can, can you just give me a tip when it comes to running the team? He, he says, uh, so what do you do? And apparently Wayne said, I do nothing. <laughs> anyway, he waited for about two, two, three seconds. And Rod Dillon, he's done uh, touch footy and all these things. Yep. He's gone, uh, he's won world championship, and he's baffled. He's going, <laughs> "What am I going to say to him? I mean, this dude doesn't even want to engage." And and Wayne then suddenly, once the coin dropped, he said, "All I do is I foster an environment where everyone wants to be there." Yeah. You know, yep. and, and and that's the amazing thing. It it's the leadership as a coach. You guys, I mean, he's got probably assistant coach and all the other coaches looking after a lot of stuff. You guys know how to play anyway. Yeah. I'm sure you probably do your job. It's a problem better than Wayne. Yep. But somehow he's not there for that. that. He's there for that attitude side, isn't it? It's they say that success is about twenty percent skill, eighty percent attitude. Yeah. I'm not going to teach you how to be a problem, yep. especially me. Yeah. But you have to be wanting, right, to run against a barrier of three guys just to crack your bones in order yeah, to help yeah. the team, right? Yeah, and that's he has this ability to, you know, make you want to do that for him. Right. You know, one of the things this year especially I noticed, right, is he expects you to go out and be Mark Nichols. That's all he wants. You know, he, I don't need you to play like so-and-so. I don't need you to, to do this. This is what you do good. And I just need you to do that. And then he does the same thing with young guys that come up into the team. And I noticed it this year a lot, you know, he, he sort of, I don't need you to be the guy you're replacing. I just need you to be you. If I get wow. if I get 17 guys that are just being them and doing it to their best of their ability, we'll win the game. You know, he, and, he, and he has no doubt in that too. And then he imparts that belief yeah. on the 17. So he sort of previously and this might have been as a younger player, but previously, you know, if, you know, one of our better players gets injured, you're sort of looking and going, well, how are we going to win it? You know, we've just lost our best player or, you know, we've got our three best players out this week. But when you're in the change room with Wayne, that's, that doesn't even, you know, it doesn't even come into your head. It's, it's, you know, these are the 17 guys that we're going to play this week and if we all play to our ability, we'll win. And he's got no doubt in that, in his mind when he's say, and saying it and you genuinely believe it. And, um, you know, and, and then... That's that whole thing, right? If you, if in your mind you just you're just focusing on the job I need to do and, and being the best I can, then you're going to do it. If you're starting to worry about other people and them doing their jobs, then your focus and attention's elsewhere, yeah. and obviously you're not going to do your job well. And and that's one of the things that he obviously is really good at as well. But a lot of people say NRL, these are blokes. I mean, really, do they want anyone to talk about their life and their emotions? Really? Yeah, you know, I, I think we've got we've got a pretty uh, amazing culture at, at South Sydney in t in terms of that. We've we've done it a, the last couple of years. Most rugby league guys come from, you know, tough upbringings, um, working class, you know, broken homes. That those kind of things. Yeah. You know, it, it's probably what draws us to rugby league as kids, right? And it, for a lot of kids, it's a, it's an outlet, you know, to go out on the field and, and play rugby league, and that. Yeah, there's the physicality, but also also the team, you know, the yeah. team environment. And, and we've created this amazing culture where the last couple of years we've been given the opportunity to sort of get up and talk about our upbringing. And, you know, I don't want to sort of say too much, but, you know, hearing guys, you know, grown men standing in front of you and telling you what they went through as kids or teenagers or, you know, even, even young adults, 
it's a special it's obviously a special environment for guys to get up and be able to be open about what they've gone through you know and, and know that the guys are going to listen to them and respect them and, and that's again it's it's one of those things that Wayne's created and, and you know like I said blokey blokes but you know guys getting up and shedding tears talking about um, you know thing and some of the stories I you know was almost or, or did shed a tear as well because you know there's some confronting stories out there but yeah. it's amazing that that the guys feel comfortable enough to, to share them. That's an amazing thing because it brought some common hum humanity and, and actually bond you guys through some, some sense of compassion. Yeah. You, and exactly. when you're on the field, it's like, mate, you're not going to touch my mate. I'm, I'm going to smash you, right? Yes. Yeah, ex exactly. It's, um, you know, and like I said, but you need to have that culture. Yeah. Where God but how does he do that? Does he do it overnight? I mean, it's, come on. And I, I can hear you're passionate about this. Maybe that's where your talk is going to be. Yeah. So, yeah. so how, how, how does he do that? that how well, can someone create it overnight? Yeah, I, you know, I, he's obviously he's only been at the club for for two years now. Yeah. You know, and and even just we've just seen it with the Queensland Origin, right? Like I was going to talk about that, but if yeah. you want to, maybe you should get in. Like, yeah, I, you know, passionate New South Wales man, but they basically everyone said they're the worst team in yeah. forty years, and somehow yeah. they they have all these rookies, and Wayne just sort of gets them going out there and almost becoming unstoppable out on the field. You know. Like, you ask me how he does it. I guess that's that's why he's been doing it for forty years, right? He, he, yeah, know, he knows you, how to you, do it. Yeah, but you, you spent two years around him. So let's let's imagine you were in the room, right? Okay. Let's imagine you were in the room of the maroon the other day. I mean, you got a t-shirt for. So <laughs> yeah, so no, what would Wayne say? I mean, he knows this team is likely to be written. I mean, there's probably newspaper ready to say the worst team ever, right? Yep. And he's got this bunch of guys that are probably all newies. What would he have done or said in there to get them to go out there and do what they've done? Well, I imagine the first thing, he, you know, he wouldn't even have said. Actually, he, he probably would have said, you know, this, this is what people are saying about it, but I don't believe that. And, you know, over a period of time, if he sort of says that every day, and, and he, the other thing is, you know, like, he's been around for so long that probably said, you know, I've coached Origin a lot of times, you know, there's... There's nothing better than being the underdog. There's nothing better than being, you know, a Queenslander. No one expects us to win, you know. I believe in you guys. That's why I've picked you right. And I don't need you to go out and, and be the superstar and score three tries. I just need you to go out and run hard and, and tackle hard and do, I like do, that line. do things that are easy. You know, they're, they're not easy things to do because you've got to put your body on the line. But, you know, I don't need you to run 100 metres and score this amazing try that all the fans are going to yeah. talk about for years and years. Yeah. I just need you to, to, every time you run, run hard, and every time you tackle, make it mean something. And and then he's imparting this belief in you. And then, yes, that's And then he's I mean. giving you this this father figure for you where you don't want to let him down. And, and he sort of just builds on that. And obviously for the origin, he would have only had a couple of weeks to do that. But at South, he's sort of, he has time to sort of to do that every session and... You know, and then if individually he's having, like I said, he's having these conversations where he shows his cares and, and stuff like that, you start to trust him as well. Yes. And, yeah. um, you know, and, and if everyone's got that relationship with him, yeah. then, you know, you're getting somewhere, I guess. Yeah, I reckon that guy must create something, an extra 20% in you by just saying, I believe in you, right? It's, and, and you almost go out there and saying to yourself, I'll die if I have to. <laughs> yeah. But if this dude believes in me, yeah. I better give it. <laughs> Well, that's the, yeah, it's like, like you said, he, he says, I believe in you, but he's also, it's, I believe in you, you know, I know what you can do, I know what yes. you... Yes, he talks to you. Yeah, I know yeah. I know your strengths as a player, I just need you to do that. Yes. You know, I, I just need you to be you. I, you've got to this level because you've obviously got enough talent and you've obviously, you know, work hard and you know how to play football and stuff, I just need you to do what you do. And all of a sudden, when you when he's saying that to you, it's like yeah, it sort of you know clicks in your head. You go, you know what? Yeah, I, that's all I need to do. I don't need to worry about scoring tries or making breaks. I, that's not who I am as a player. I just yes. need to be me. Yeah. Do you know I do a lot of podcasts, and one of the things I like doing is podcasts of people that I call ordinary. And and I think that you've got so much humility when you said, oh, you know, I'm not well beat or, or I'm I'm nothing of a great player. Seriously. But you're still here, right? <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, so this is the bit. It's, it's always looking at the moment, yeah. right? you know, not looking at the past because the past is nothing but just the wake that's gone behind. Yep. So you are known as uh, Mr. Resilient, 
you are known as I think Mr. Reliable as well. Yep. So so what is it about you? What is it about you that you brought to the game? Oh, we talked about it before. You know, there's, you've got to be talented enough to make it as an NRL player. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess f for me, it was always my passion. I always wanted to be. You know, I started playing rugby league when I was four years old, and you know, watched my dad and and uncle play local first grade. You know, funnily enough, growing up as a kid, you know, even till I was 12, 13, 14, you know, my dream was to just play local, captain local first grade team because, you know, I'd spent my childhood watching my dad and uncle play local first grade and we're talking, you know, out in the bush. And, um, and you know, it was sort of playing NRL was, you know, because Sydney was so far away from us, for us, it was, you know, I'd love to play NRL, but for me, I just want to be like my dad. And, um, you know, and, and then we sort of moved as a family to Canberra when I was 15 and sort of started playing Raiders uh, under 16s there. And then sort of a couple of years later, I think I was around 18 and, and I got picked for the like under 18s origin. So New South Wales versus Queensland. It was that stage I went, you know, I'm sort of, you know, this is the best 34 kids in, in the country basically that play this game. You know, maybe I'll can play NRL, maybe I'm, I am good enough to be an NRL player and then I sort of, like I said, spent a lot of time on the fringe and, you know, I guess sort of that whole, you know, doubt whether it's worth the effort, whether you're good enough sort of came into my mind at times but I sort of kept coming back to the same thing was, you know, I'm doing what I love, I'm living out my dream, I can't do this forever so, you know, I may as well give it my best crack now and, and then it sort of was almost... You know, I've, done, I've worked too hard too to just sort of give up. So, you know, I just sort of kept kept trying and kept trying. And, you know, every time I sort of got in and got, got a taste for it and then sort of got dropped back to reserve grade or, you know, I, I sort of got injured or whatever it was, it sort of just kept fueling that fire. And I guess now that I'm, I guess I've become a regular at South, it's it's sort of like, well, I don't want to let myself down. You know, I've worked, I've worked too hard to to get here and, and sort of, as I said, I see myself as probably not the most talented player, but I, I also, you know, one of the things all coaches have sort of said to me too, I, I remember going back to Craig, one of the things, well, the thing he said to me every week before before I ran out there, he said, you know, you might not get long tonight, but when you're on the field, I don't, no one works harder than you. And, you know, I guess having that work ethic is what makes you reliable and, and consistent and and those sort of things, I guess. Yeah, but where's the work ethic coming from? Mum, dad, what's happened? Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess both my mum and dad, you know, both my grandfathers um, drove trucks for a living, you know, all their lives. And then sort of, you know, mum was probably the first one in her family to go to uni. Dad was the same. You know, and, and I've always seen them, you know, work hard and, and being from the country and we sort of, it's not like we went without growing up, but yeah, pretty much everything my parents worked for was to give for us kids. And I guess over time you sort of, you see that and you, you know, I guess you pick up the, the same traits. Yeah. Um, you know, that you're, it's like you're a product of your environment, right? So if, you're, if your parents are hard workers and go-getters and, you know, eventually you sort of, the penny drops for you. That's, yeah. you know, that's but you're going to have to drop your humi humility for a second, right? Because I'm trying to find your secret here. Because for many seasons, you don't score a point. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. You you go in a, a, a team that is a strong team and you get so, my, so many injuries that at some stage you have to say, hold on, mate. I keep on doing zero, 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 season in, season out. And I'm now getting injured on top of it. Yeah. Right? Week in, week out. This has to stop. So that's what normal people do. They say, this has to stop. I'm, I'm not made for this shit. Right? But then you just go to another level where that, that takes a very special person. So some kind of thinking. So unless we're not going to let you off until you share <laughs> with us this, this magic formula. So what is it that goes inside an athlete's mind that gets him to... Decide, you know, no, 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 no. It, zero, zero does not mean that there's going to be points ahead. Yeah, I, um, yeah, I, I guess it's like I said, right? Every time I felt like I had a setback and I kick stones, you know, the natural reaction is to is to kick stones and sort of say, you know, this is too hard, or 
yeah, I'm sick of doing this. You know, and that, there's that saying, yeah, if you keep doing the same thing over and over, you, you get the same result. And I kept coming back. We actually had a talk when we were at the storm, and it might have been the year I was injured, and it was about gratitude. And, you know, the guy who ran it, it was sort of, you know, mindset and gratitude and, and stuff like that. So he was sort of, he played cricket, not at a, any great level, but he, he talked about going over to India and, um, and he was playing this tour and he sort of, you know, he, he kept complaining about things and, he, and he, they met this kid and, um, and he sort of was living on the streets in India and he was, and he was only a kid. Yep. And um, he sort of just followed, followed these guys around and, and, and the guy's telling the story and he's, you know, like he was sort of, you know, they felt bad for him because he was living on the street, but he was kind of a little bit annoying as well. But he sort of said, you know, they, they'd spent this day, right, playing cricket and, and he said they didn't have Powerade and he said that the night before they slept in a hotel with no air con in, you know, India, hot as, and so they didn't get a good sleep. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and talked about some other things that, that the day had just been a bad day. They hadn't played well and... And what had happened was they, they told this kid, you know, where this is where we're going to dinner tomorrow night. And the kid turns up to the dinner. And they go, oh, you know, this kid's still here. And so they say, oh, well, you know, sit down, we'll, we'll buy you dinner. And he, they're talking over dinner about how bad their day was. And the kid goes, hang on, you got to sleep in a bed last night? And they go, yeah, yeah, but the aircon didn't work. And then the kid goes, what, what do you like normally get Powerade for every meal you play? <laughs> and they go, yeah, yeah, and then and, and it was just these things, and this and yeah. this kid was blown away, you know, and he was like, what are you complaining about? This <laughs> sounds like the dream. Yeah. And so the guy comes back, and he sort of and he and he's telling this story, and and you can tell, you know, that he the way he tells it, it was sort of with passion and and whatnot, and um, and then he sort of talks about gratitude and and having the right mindset and perspective, perspective, right? yeah. and and you know those kind of things and I remember walking out of that and I was in my mid twenties, hadn't really, you know, had this dream of playing NRL, being a star, you know, whatever. And it probably wasn't happening for me. It was sort of, like I said, you know, I was getting tastes of it and then the highs of playing a couple of games and then the lows of being injured or being dropped or, or you know, not having a coach that wasn't picking me and didn't believe in me or whatnot. And, um, and I kept coming back to the sort of same thing, you know what, guess what, I'm doing what I love. Yes. I can't do this till I'm 50 or 60, you know, so I've, I've, I can only do it now. So maybe I've, someone like you, maybe, I'm not sure, you're only 30, so another 10 years maybe. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't think so. <laughs> um, the young boys are too too quick and too, too fast <laughs> these days. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's sort of like, you know what, like if I said when I was four that I would still be doing it at 30, you know, I would have... Of course, I'll do anything to do that. And um, and it kept coming back to the same thing. You know what? I, I love what I'm doing. I've always wanted to do it. I'm living out my dream. I can't do this forever. So if I quit today, I can't turn around in 10 years' time and go, oh, you know what? I wish I didn't quit. I can go back. I'll go back to that. Well, you can't do that if you're yep. an athlete. You know, you can't you can't be an athlete at 50 or 60. You you sort of can only do it to 40 max, most sports. And then, and then it sort of just came back, well, you know what? Maybe if I just keep working hard, you know, something will happen. And, and like I said, it wasn't like I was banging down the door and, and not going anywhere. I was, I was getting these tastes and I, I was playing a couple of games here or there and I, I, knew I, could, I knew I could play. I knew I would play a few games and get injured or I would get dropped. And even when I was playing reserve grade, you know, I was sort of always one of the better players. And so in uh, rugby league, we have what's called the 18th man. And basically the 18th man warms up goes to the game, prepares as normal, and if someone gets injured or gets sick, then they they fill in. And, yeah. and so it's sort of like a, a backup reserve. And, um, and you know, before I come to South, I'd played, I think I played 28 NRL games in, in seven years, but I reckon I was 8th man about 50 times. So I knew I was, I knew I was that close. <laughs> the you next know? guy, you know. Yeah, I was the next guy <laughs> in that many times. So I was like, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty much there. Yeah. I just, I, I, I can't give up now. Like if I, if I give up now, I might regret it forever. And, um, and then, you know, luckily I, I came to South and, you know, found a bit of a home here. And the other thing that probably happened around that time in my life, funnily enough, is I met my partner down in Melbourne just before we left. Right. And um, and then coming to Sydney, 
with a bit more stability off the field is probably also, uh, well, I've got no doubt it, it helped. And, and now that I look back, you know, it's probably when I was a young guy, like, you know, I would drink and sort of as any young guy and, you know, lived with... Powerade, um, I, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not, well, Powerade <laughs> the next day um, to get ready for training after a big night out but um you know even like stuff like diet and and even the mental side of stuff all that stuff you know you're just a young guy living out your dream you don't sort of really focus or worry that much and um you know i, I was always like i said i was hard work i was always a good trainer so I, I always used to be able to justify drinking or not eating that good by you know what well i'm still i'm still training well you know i'm still getting games here or there i'm still playing good in reserve grade so you know i, I almost you justify those sort of behaviours but you know meeting my partner and sort of becoming a bit more settled off the field yep. I look back now and maybe it only made me a 5% better player or 10% better player but that's all I needed to go from that level of being right on the fringe to to you know being the guy in the team every week yeah um um, the reason I'm asking that, so there's obviously a huge element of self-talk. I, I can see your self-talk is very grounded. Maybe that's from the kind of the country, you know, yeah, the country yep. boy in you. Yep. But at that point when you're having those doubts, do you have a mentor you go to? Is that when you go to a, a, other team players and, or, or do you go to a coach? Or is that what you, you now do? Because they, they probably the young kids are looking up to you like at the senior now and probably there are times when they have self-doubt or you look, you look in the eye and you go, I know exactly where you're at, right? Yeah, yeah, Fun funnily enough, um, you know, just, just this year, so one of the, you know, I'm not going to say like names or whatever, but, you know, there was a young guy who sort of, the club had said, you know, we need you to get bigger and that was something when I was at Canberra, so coming through the grades, I was sort of, you know, I was always tall, but I was pretty skinny, and it was always something you need to get bigger. And then, you know, when I wasn't playing first grade, towards the end of my first grade career at, at the Raiders, it was another thing. It was, you know, we need you to get bigger. We need you to run over blokes. You know, I played front row, so the coach had said, you know, I want my front rowers to to run over guys and and, and be aggressive and. And this, this style of play, wanted a certain style of play and that wasn't me as a player. Um, and I spent a year trying to be that player in reserve grade and it, it, it didn't work, you know. And, um, and I, could see, I could see this young guy that was going through the same thing. He was thinking that they want me to be bigger. You know, they want you to be, me to be whatever. And I sort of just said to him, you know, I've, I've been there. You know, if you just keep being you as a player, eventually, a coach will will identify, you know, that's the type of player I want in the team, yeah, and and he'll pick you for that. And he, and you know, if you try and change too much, then you you might try and be this player, and it might work out, but you might not. You know, you might not have the tools or the skill to be able to be the player that you're trying to trying to be, and you you won't make it e anyway. So yeah. um, it was funny, you know, I, I could see that that look, that look in his eye, and then I felt like I had to say something to him, and I guess that's one of the Good things of being a being an older guy, and, um, and and going back to to sort of when I was at Canberra and that whole sort of self doubt. There was a there was a player. It was Brett White who who was coming to the end of his career at Canberra, and um, and he sort of pulled me aside and and said to me, you know, like you know, don't give up, sort of thing. And, and he sort of wanted me to stay at the club, and I said, look, I, I just I feel like I need a change. I, I sort of I've been not playing here and, and banging my head against the brick wall thinking, you know, how am I going to get a go? And I said, you know, I've, I've got an opportunity to go to Melbourne. They've been doing it for years, you know, I've, I'm watching all these guys go down there and turn into better players. I want to just go down. And he'd been at Melbourne. And he was like, oh, you know, I really think you should stay here. But I understand, you know, I've been down there. It will make you a better player. Um, you know, you'll love being coached by Craig. And, and he was sort of saying, you know, don't give up, you know. And, and having those older guys say that to you is sort of, I guess, a bit of motivation as well. Yes, I understand. Now, I've got young kids around me who are playing uh, tennis. And, uh, uh, not high level, but they, that's their aim, right? Yep. You said earlier at the beginning that when you were younger, that was one of your dreams to play at the top. Yep. What would be five tips that you would give young people aspiring to becoming a high level athlete? What are the five things that you'd say, if you do that, you'll be there? 
Yeah, I, I, well, I guess the first thing you'd, you'd sort of say is don't put too much pressure on yourself because, I mean, every kid playing sport wants to, I'm assuming, you know, every kid that's playing tennis at a young age. Are wants you saying to, that to the parents or are you saying to the kids? Well, well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, e exactly. You know, like how many times do you see it? The, yeah. The um, you know, even when, even the kids that do make it, and they've got the. <laughs> I think it might be tennis. Actually, it's a, it's a common denominator. Yeah, Serena Williams. Tennis, yeah. tennis parents. Yeah, but I think I think the main thing, right, is like you just got to enjoy it. Yep. Um, so is that your number two? Enjoy? Or is it not your number one? No, nah, so? I'm going to say number one is enjoy it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, because. To do something for a long period of time, you have to you have to have the passion, you know. Yes. To be an athlete, you have to get out of bed every day, and go and train and and push your body to a limit. And yeah. And if you don't enjoy what you're doing, then you know it gets hard to get out of bed. And it's it's like it it's like it's everything, you know. It's not even yeah. You know, if you don't enjoy your job, it gets hard to to go through. If you're running a business and you don't enjoy it, then you know eventually it's gonna eat you up, sort of yes. thing. Yes. Um, so yeah, I guess I guess number one is just just enjoy it. I guess two, you know, for me, like sort of goal setting has always been something that I've done. I write my goals out, you know, in everything, sport, financial goals, you know, some some life goals I want to do. Sort of, every, it's almost like a New Year's resolution, but not like a this is what I want to do this year. It's sort of just some stuff that you know in, in different parts of my life that I want to focus on, and and you know I write them out every year, sort of just after New Year's and put them on the fridge and you know, generally around the middle of the year I sort of have a look at what I'm doing and, and twig them a bit sort of thing. Um, but it's always on the fridge. It's, it's on the fridge. It's always... Public. Yeah, it's always, you know, it's somewhere so you've where... you got teammates coming over and have a look and say, yeah, hey, you're not there or what? Family, friends, I guess, <laughs> I guess you know, that's that accountability, right? If you, yeah. If you write something out, you know, the whole thing of like goal setting is it needs to be, you know, something realistic but something... That you can strive for, and and if you if you write it down and you put it in a place where everyone's going to see it, then it? yeah, all of a sudden it, you, you're accountable to it. Because like you said, if someone comes over and says, <laughs> "Yeah, mate, you said this, you're writing here that you want to do this," and <laughs> I've never seen you once, <laughs> you know, um, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so yeah, goal setting and goal settings, uh, it's sort of something that I've always always used. Um, yes. So I think that's I think that's a great thing because because it sort of when you sit down to write goals, you need to think about, you know, where I want to, where I want to get to, and, and you sort of have to visualise it and, and picture yourself. And it's sort of like, you know, it might be, oh, by the end of the year, I want to win this tennis tournament that I've been doing for five years and never won it. And then you sort of got to go back from that and work out, well, I'm not just going to turn up on the day and win it, am I? What do I have to do to, to get to that point? And and then, you know, that hard work, that getting out of bed every day, you sort yeah. of, you sort of got that. But, but you, you've opened a can of worms, because, but it's great to ask you because being an athlete, you, you, you guys are pretty good in goal setting. But in the business world, there's so many people who just write down goals. And right now, right about December, there's a <laughs> lot of goals uh, being written down. But many of them are writing these goals, number one, half believing or not even believing in it. Uh, number two, they write goals that they know other people want to know about them. And then number three, they really... Right goals so that you know it's not empty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so they don't have to even believe in it. So, how do you guys? What would you advise those people then? Uh, I mean, how how do these guys listen to this podcast and say, "Ah, oh, my goal setting, man, that doesn't work for me." Well, I guess the thing for me is I've seen it work. So, yeah, you know, I guess if you if you're someone who who writes goals out and you never fulfil them, then something's not happening. Whether the the goals are unrealistic to start with, or whether you know, like you said, it's just uh, you're writing it on a piece of paper for the sake of saying I've I've written down my goals for the month or yeah. the year or whatever. Um, you know, if you write if you write it down, you need to believe in them, and that's one of the tools. Right, is if you like, I put it on the fridge. So if you, if you write it down and and put it out in public, and, and you don't want to put it on your Facebook or anything, but if you put it in a place where you see it every day, you know, it might be in the mirror or whatever, then. Personally, for me, I can't be a person if I write it down and then I'm I'm looking at it every day and I know I'm not doing it. You know, I that, I'm, I can't be that person. So if I'm looking at it every day and there's something there that I haven't been doing, I go, well, you know what, I I got to go do that because I wrote that down. That's amazing. Yeah, I you know I sat down and this is where I, I wrote it down because I wanted to get to that point, 
and now I'm not doing anything about it. So it's you don't want to lie to yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and going back to sort of Wayne's thing, that's you know one of his things that he regularly talks about is you know living above and below the line, and 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 living below the line is you know justifying bad decisions or making excuses or blaming others and lying to yourself is you know the, one of the biggest things that you know you can do is in terms of that living below the line and then sort of living above the line is that accountability and doing things you know that are going to get you places and yeah. and um and, and he sort of talks about that that kind of stuff pretty regularly actually right right so we only got two mate then Three more. Yeah, yeah I, I promised my daughters I was going to ask you yeah, about, yeah. Uh, at least about those five. And um, you're going to have mean, to share. I mean, another one, right? Um, I guess we've, just thinking back now, we've spoken about it a lot, you know, like having good coaches and good people around you is going to help you get to get to where you want to go because, you know, we've, we've touched on it, right? Yes. A bad coach um, that I've had previously and sort of how it affected me as a player and then having these good coaches and... Yeah, but these coaches, like, they're like mentors. they fathers, mentors, yes. aren't they? I mean, I, I, I've been listening to you and the way you talk about these ones, especially Wayne, I could feel the passion in you. It's yeah. almost like you, you could do the whole... For the rest of your life, just spend time just talking, uh, public talking about, speaking about them, you know? Talking about Wayne. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if he'd be too happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, listen. If he is a coach that he know he knows if he can make a difference in your life on field, why not? Yeah. If he can even impact you after the game, why not? Yeah. Really. Yeah. So what's number four? Yeah. Well, I guess maybe we could put that. You know, that number four is sort of. I guess that the whole you don't want to put too much pressure on yourself. It goes back to that enjoyment, right? Like. If you're putting a lot of pressure on yourself to make it or you know to be it then then you're probably gonna start resenting resenting it almost it's it almost needs to be it's a fine balance right because you want to strive for something and you want to believe in it yeah and, and it probably yeah. for, for some people yeah, it works, not, not not put the level of expectation so that the destination is the only thing that matters but also enjoy the journey right yeah yeah i guess and i guess that's probably one of the things that that, that I've been able to do, to do is in, enjoy the enjoy the journey and yeah I guess if I if if at times I sort of put pressure on myself you know maybe I wouldn't have started resenting yes. it and, and it would have been an easier decision to to just quit and to just say that's you right. know this is too hard I'm not gonna it's not for me I'll, I'll go try something else and that's obviously that's not what you want to get to because you know you've you've started you're playing tennis because you love it and you want to make it as a tennis player because yeah you love the sport yeah you know, again one of the things that that Wayne has spoken about is you know just because you want to play NRL that's your goal as a kid just because you don't play NRL that doesn't mean you know you you failed or you can't yes. enjoy rugby league you know you, you can still you can still you know go and play a decent level you know you potentially could play overseas you could still get a lot of enjoyment out yep. of playing rugby league you might you know you, you might start a family and go captain coach in the country for a couple of years and they might give you a good job and then you come back to the city and you've you know you're ahead of where you would have been without rugby league mm. um you know it, it's difficult to, to do that though because we live in the western world where being the best big number one is what pays right yeah so there's a lot of people who don't understand to even wear the the South Sydney jersey, it, I mean, not many people do that. I have to buy one, right? If I wanted one, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so yeah. you just get to wear them. Well, and, I, and I think like, a, so I don't know if I'm wording it right, but one of the the things that stands out to me when I started at the Canberra Raiders at under 16s, how Matt. So we started in the December before the season, doing preseason stuff. We were all 15 year old kids. Everyone in that room wanted to play NRL. And yes. It basically, it was all the parents came in on the Saturday morning before we started training, and they sat sat us down, and they, they sort of had all the parents, and they sort of went through. And it was basically, they said, you know, as a club, we're probably one of the better clubs at turning our junior players into NRL players. And they said, at the moment, we're running at around seven or eight percent. So they said, if you look around this room right now. There's probably only going to be two or three guys that are going to go on and play NRL from from this group of kids. You know, that's over years of 
us doing what we do, it's a fact. And, um, and, and I remember at the time looking around the room and going, shit, there's about <laughs> 10 kids in here that are better than me. <laughs> I'm no chance. Um, but you know, that's the thing, right? Like you, you want to be the best, but it's, it's, it's hard. That's the, it's hard to get to the NRL. It's hard to get to the top of your chosen sport or your chosen business or Yeah, or enjoy whatever. the journey. Yeah. I, I really like that. Yeah. Enjoy the sport and enjoy the journey. Yeah. And the last one? Yeah, number five, I, I guess for me, and you know, it's probably the, the same as, as young kids, is that, that sort of growth mindset because no matter what you do and who you are, you're always going to have setbacks. And the natural reaction, like, I, I remember when I, was, when I was dropped as a young guy, um, at the start of the year, it was Canberra, and I was, it was... Uh, 2013 and I worked really hard all that pre-season and I'd got in the team for round one and I sort of you know almost patted myself on the back a bit but we sort of we went to Penrith and we got flogged and then the next week we went to the Gold Coast and we got flogged again and the sort of the coach had said in between you know like if, if I get that performance again I'm making changes and and so we got flogged again and you know the only change that was made that next week was me getting dropped then I'd played the least minutes in both games and I was the youngest guy in the team. And so I was thinking, well, you know, like, it wasn't my fault we lost. I've hardly played and I'm the youngest guy. Like, drop other guys. And, um, <laughs> and, and you know, I sort of, I kicked stones and, and I'm sort of not proud to admit it, but I went out midweek and, and got drunk because I had the shits and then, you know, I played reserve grade on the Saturday and got drunk again after that and then sort of, it was almost like I'll oh, make the coaches feel sorry for. Like I started, you know, sort of not really trying that hard at training, and then sort of I started justifying my behaviours. You know, I need to play good in reserve grade this week, so I won't try as hard at training because I'm not playing first grade. So what does it matter? And you know, this went on for a couple of weeks, and it wasn't until one of my best mates, Paul Vaughan, got to debut, and and I'd been playing reserve grade with him, and he'd been killing it. But I just assumed, you know, if if there was an injury or someone got dropped, they'd just bring me back up, you know. I, in my head, I got unfairly dropped, so but that's not how support works, right? They're going to pick the best guy for the job. Yeah. And, um, and you know, it was sort of that, that moment where I was like, geez, I've been kicking stones and, like, carrying on like a spoiled little brat. And, um, you know, the coach is never going to feel sorry for me. They, they, they're just going to pick the, the best guy for the job. And then, you know, it was funny. I sort of... I started trying harder at training and I sort of, you know, stopped drinking and focused a bit more on what I was eating and sleeping and whatnot and <laughs> started playing good footy again and then got injured and it was out for the rest of the year. I sort of always think back to that moment and think, you know, like if I had the right mindset and, and I was over young and, you, and it's something you learn, you know, through experience and stuff like that. And um, like I said, there's always setbacks. So how you handle them, you know, defines what happens next. And, you know, I always look back and think about that moment and, a couple of times, you know, at South, I've, I've been dropped and instead of being like, well, poor me, I've just gone, well, you know, that, that happens. If I'm going to go back and play reserve grade this week, I want to be the best player. Or, you know, around training, I'm going to I'm gonna train better than I did last week. And, um, you know, I'll do more extras than I was doing because instead of that, uh, that mindset where I was like, I'll make the coach feel sorry for dropping me by kicking stones, I'll make the coach think, geez, I've got to to pick that guy like he wants to get back that's in that's amazing um yeah so I, I mean that's probably the fifth thing they put through is, is, mindset yeah wow. is, you know you you're always going to have setbacks and adversity and, and, it, and it's a hard thing because that first natural reaction is always well like poor me and or you get angry at if it's your boss or your teacher you get angry and, and but then you sort of need to be able to step back and say well you know what like, what did I do? What could I do better? What have I done wrong? You know, and then if, if you can identify that, then you can go around, go about trying to change it or trying to be better. And for me, whenever the next opportunities come along, then it's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm better prepared for it now. And two, I sort of, I don't want to, I don't want to get dropped again, so. Oh, well, uh, mate, it's been actually uh, great to, uh, to meet with you because I think... I was expecting a player who was going to really sit down and talk to me about the game. Yeah. 
I've been thinking over the last few days, how do I tell the guy I don't know anything about the game? So I thought I better come out and just say I don't know anything about the game. And the reason I want to do this is I believe games bring out virtues in people. And I can see so many of them in you. And those virtues actually can not only teach others about their own life, their own work, yep. but it also will be translated later on into other things that you're going to be doing. So, mate, I, I really thank you so much for taking the time and share with us today. No, thanks for having me. I think some of the questions that you asked and probed, it's made me sort of almost reflect back on things, and it's been really good, actually. Thank you very much.